Hello and welcome. I'm Gugule Tungfupi and we're bringing you all the highlights from the 5th Africa Public-Private Partnership Conference held here in Johannesburg. PPPs are beginning to gain traction in Africa, with countries such as Nigeria, Tanzania and South Africa implementing PPP procurement practices successfully. The shift in mindset is inevitably seeing businesses and governments head closer towards one key strategic goal, creating jobs for Africa's billion-plus people and so achieving economic prosperity. Organized by AME Trade, the Africa Public-Private Partnership Conference was established as the leading high-level international pan-African PPP strategy and infrastructure partnering conference. The theme for 2013 focused on the private sector, the engine for structural transformation in Africa. Let's take a look at some of the key issues that were addressed. In Nigeria, it is clear to us that considering the challenges we face, particularly in the area of revenue generation, that there's no better way to deliver critical infrastructure in our country other than the public-private partnership. And that is why in Nigeria, the enabling environment has been created since 2005. The government had entered the Infrastructure Concession and Regulatory Commission. And uh, by 2009, we had also developed the national policy on public-private partnership. And that has been a very good foundation for PPP transactions to thrive in Nigeria. Uh, as we speak, uh, we hope to rake in about $2 billion private sector investment in two projects in my ministry alone. Uh, the PPP model has come to stay in Nigeria because we've realized the potency of that particular model. We are excited about it and like I said, the federal government has created the enabling environment and there's no going back. The private sector is keen to come into Nigeria and in fact, uh, we not being immodest. It's UNCTAD uh, who has reported that last year Nigeria has become one of the most important destinations for investment in Africa and we're very proud of that and that I think is because of the, the framework that we have even though we do have challenges relating to power and insecurity and certain experts but still regardless of those challenges people and investors are trooping in to partake in the investment opportunities. What's important for, P for PPPs as they go forward and dealing with the risk uh, uh, point is that you really need to make sure that even prior to a PPP coming into the market, those issues around risk are highlighted. And you know your, pr your project, even at that point in time at pre-feasibility, is already dealing with the risk issues. Once you get into a feasibility uh, environment, it's being able to ensure that the transaction advisors and the government institution itself both understand what the risks are and how they both will ensure they tackle those and be able to mitigate uh, them. But more importantly, I think what's really critical for, for risk in PPPs it's the after, it's the monitoring, it's the evaluation. Because when your risk issues come up is because of the misinterpretation of the contract between the parties. And so what's really important at that point is that the monitoring of a particular uh, a concession agreement has to be in place. And so the government institution that is in that PPP needs to make sure it resources properly to monitor for that. Africa as a diverse developing nation produces a unique set of challenges when it comes to doing business. Key delegates at the conference participated in a panel discussion where we dissected the elements that determines the PPP business model and gained insight into the implementation of PPP schemes in Africa. Mm -hmm. Earlier we were having a discussion that it really is a mindset change that needs to take place not only in the private sector but also in the public sector. Uh, how have you viewed that since the introduction of PPPs? You yeah, know, I, I think it requires a, a mind change because either by, by design or by default, you cannot really do without uh, uh, PPPs. When you look at the, the scale of, of the need, uh, I think you know people who are around this room know enough the sector that I don't need to repeat all the numbers. But just to give, to take one example, for us to catch up as um, African continent, to catch up in terms of power, uh, uh, energy uh, generation, to catch up with economic growth, we need in the next 20 years, we need to build 50 gigawatt more of power. Mm. Uh, that's a lot, that's a lot of gigawatts. And uh, you compare that with how little and how constraints governments are in terms of, you know, being able to put uh, forth the funding required. And you see very obviously the, the needs to bring in private sector. 
um, and, and where we think private, uh, PPPs are quite interesting is that you're not bringing in private sector to take over government responsibilities. You're really bringing in private sector so that they can work with governments uh, to have a public goods role at the same time as investing to, to, make, to make money. So it's a meeting of minds and a meeting of interest and, and I think that's a, that's a very exciting uh, area to be involved in. Pedro was nodding his head rather enthusiastically there when you touched <laughs> on the private sector and you represent the private sector as well. And you have a lot of experience visiting other emerging markets uh, like Iran as well as uh, Portugal. The private sector in general with regard to emerging markets when it comes to PPPs, uh, are we still resistant to change perhaps? We are, we are living a fantastic time because um, we are today uh, 7 billion people in the planet. We're going to be 9 billion very soon. I would say there is an infrastructure gap today. And so imagine with 2 more billion people in the planet. And so uh, there's a, a huge uh, 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 infrastructure gap. And, uh, and, and, and actually, there is a great need of infrastructure. Now, What's, what's happening, and that's very interesting, is that today the infrastructure gap in Europe is probably much less, I would say, uh, basically because the population is the same and it's, going, it's, it's, it's being stable. And so it's, it's very interesting because you, you have to imagine that if you, if you like to think what type of Lego do you have to put together for people to enhance their quality of life, then uh, uh, the Lego has to be developed in a lot of different places, where, and those are the places where you have to be. Now, the question is, how are you going to, because it, it, it's very important to, to understand that it's, it's more, than, more than the Lego itself, is how are we going to create a public service, uh, and this, for this public service to be um, uh, existing, you have to create these assets. And so the question, the question is, how are you going to fill in? How, what type of solutions are you going to put together to make sure that the asset, the infrastructure, is going to be up and running? And I would say that you, uh, from uh, uh, what, what, what was just said, you have to bring in not only the ability to uh, understand the infrastructures that are missing, but the funding to make sure that these infrastructures are going to, 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 to happen. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and so I believe it's a very beautiful challenge for all of us to understand and, uh, and, uh, and define the priorities. I, I would say it's very easy to um, name projects. It's very hard to name bankable projects. And so we have to create and define the priorities. And, and this is, this is, this is the, 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 big, the big challenge to, to all of us, you know? We, we all know uh, that we have to do a lot of things. Now, what are the things that we have to do first? Mm -hmm. I'd like to come to you, Louis. You represent the DBSA. And uh, no doubt, Pedro touched on funding, which is a very important aspect with regard to projects. But uh, bankers need to play a lot more of an integra integral role when it comes to PPPs, and that's something that the DBSA does. Uh, walk us through some of the changes uh, that have occurred over the last couple of years. Instead of just pumping money into funds, you really are hands-on now. Yes, thank you very much, Gugu. It's, it's a key role for us to actually seek to develop the projects, to be reactive and just wait for projects to happen. Uh, very few projects realize like that. So you have to become involved uh, not only at the standard uh, feasibility funding stage, but even earlier where it's at the project conceptualization stand. Understanding what the ecosystem is in which the project actually functions and how it adds value uh, to the value chain. Uh, we were talking earlier about the Dar es Salaam port. It was a highly successful PPP, but then suddenly they realized, but hold on, we actually need to look at the railway line. And following from that, it'll pro probably be that they need to look at intermodal hubs inland uh, to actually realize the full value chain of that PPP. Um, and it's our role as such to, to help attract private sector into these PPPs and to help concept uh, conceptualize them and actually develop the PPPs. Just on pension funds, uh, earlier we also discussed how they could potentially also contribute to the funding regarding uh, uh, PPPs. And I don't know, Mohammed, or maybe if you have uh, uh, pointers to attribute to that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, pension fund has the, uh, 
this, this characteristic that they um, manage and take care of long-term assets. Um, and uh, you know, your typical pension fund will basically, not that, I, not that I have much against US Treasury bonds or as a bonds, but your typical pension fund will put quite a sizable share of its uh, assets in, in US Treasury bonds. And at the moment now, <laughs> they will be making two, three percent. So um, the, um, the infrastructure space gives them the opportunity to actually have a stream of cash flow that is stable and that also matches their requirement in terms of uh, long-term funding. Um, in fact, as ADB, we just, as most of you will have uh, heard, we just initiated a major uh, project which is called Africa 50. And uh, I can talk about it a little bit more in, um, later, but in relation to pension funds, the, one of the key characteristics of this fund is really to try and in, capitalize it from internally generated cash within Africa to a large extent. And, and one of the sources of funding that would be tapping in is, is uh, in addition to sovereign funds and uh, diaspora bonds and the rest are, are pension funds because we think there is a very good match between their requirements in terms of placement and the opportunity that the uh, infrastructure space offers. But the one challenge that the PPPs have is that they need longer term debt funding. Mm -hmm. um, and as of today, it still is the main domain of, of, of the development financial institutions, the ADB, DBSA, EIB, those kind of entities, to actually create the depth in the assets. The problem is you talk about big infrastructure, big investments, and you can't pay that off in, in five years or ten years. Uh, you need much longer term debt money to actually make it attractive investments. And it's that layering that the DFIs need to do uh, to make the PPPs work. That sounds like a bit of a challenge, James, and you've been in the game for a long time. Uh, should we be looking over abroad, perhaps, from an African perspective and go to the IMF for, for certain funding? Or the World Bank, perhaps? Well, the World Bank does participate uh, here in South Africa in a host of different uh, uh, scenarios, uh, not necessarily funding uh, for public-private partnerships, but in helping develop projects. And of course, the IFC will fund uh, public-private partnerships. But here in South Africa, we have found uh, no, no uh, uh, dearth of financial capabilities in the country to step up uh, to the plate and, and finance PPPs. When we come back from the break, the panelists look at innovative ways to tailor PPPs to local environments. We're bringing you the highlights from the 5th Africa Public-Private Partnership Conference in Johannesburg. A thought-provoking discussion took place looking at the importance of PPPs in revolutionizing the African continent. Mama and Don, coming to you, uh, you work on a normal, more continental perspective and uh, touching on some of the issues that uh, Pedro highlighted there, that you need the, the local connection. How does the AFDB uh, work against such, such challenges? Yeah, I mean, two, two, two aspects. The, um, the first aspect is in terms of the role of the, of the government, which, which is local. Obviously, we will all agree that the government needs to play the role of a uh, regulator, make sure that the environment there is there, that uh, investment conditions are ripe for investors, in particular international investors, to, to come in. I think that's an obvious role. Uh, we shouldn't also um, lose track of the fact that governments do have a fairly large role to play, also even in investments. Um, now, when we talk about the, um, the uh, funding gap in infrastructure, you know, 30, 40 billion dollars per year, depending on whom you speak to, that supersedes the fact that currently in Africa we do invest around $35 billion every year in infrastructure, and most of that money comes from, uh, from uh, public sector money. Um, further, my, my, actually my personal view is that uh, we do not tap into public sector money as much as we should. Um, and this is a debate to be had with, you know, in other circles probably, with the IMF and the rest. Most African countries have gone through the restructuring of their debt phase, and most of them have very little debt in their books. You know, the, the, uh, the, the, common, the, the common measurement of debt sustainability is the percentage of debt to GDP. When you look at 
countries across Africa, they all around 30%. In fact, one country that, that I've, I looked at carefully because they have a very ambitious investment program is, is Nigeria. When you look at their debt to, to GDP ratio, now it's less than 20%. Now you compare that with France, even the US, and other countries, uh, those debt levels are three, four times. So my point is, I think there is something to, say, to be said about the uh, necessity for uh, governments locally, because that was your question, to be borrowing more to invest in infrastructure as long as those investments are actually expected to, to generate cash flow and do not have any negative effect on the, uh, on the budget uh, of those countries. I think this is um, um, a debate to be, uh, to be had. Now, beyond governments, of course, um, and um, we at ADB try to promote as much as we can the participation of uh, local investors. Uh, one, because we are about um, promoting of promotion of African entrepreneurship, but also for the sake of the success of the company. I think it is important to have somebody that brings in the local knowledge, uh, that brings in the local contents, and that gives it uh, investors some level of, of comfort uh, going forward. James, to get your perspective on a more South African view? Yeah, let me try to put a different spin on this. Uh, there, there's no dearth of money here in South Africa at all. As a matter of fact, the government spending on infrastructure dwarfs the amount of money that is spent uh, on uh, PPPs by uh, several orders of magnitude. But we find that uh, perhaps the greatest driver of public-private partnerships here in South Africa, and by the way, we're demand-driven. Nobody orders a department to procure a piece of services infrastructure by a PPP. The greatest uh, driver of PPPs in this country is expertise is the, the private sector expertise in performing uh, a, comp, uh, a complex function by building a complex uh, uh, infrastructure and by maintaining and providing the services from it uh, that uh, otherwise are not available. Mm -hmm. You can certainly comment on that uh, with regard to uh, the skill set that, and maybe the transference of skills, uh, which is also something that's very important from the private sector to the public perhaps. It is, uh, again, uh, very, very interesting because um, if um, um, one of the issues that uh, you, you have with PPPs in, uh, in Europe, namely, is the fact that uh, unions uh, feel a threat by uh, having uh, people coming from the private sector doing what they used to do. Uh, uh, it's very interesting because in a lot of countries where you need to do capacity building works the other way around. Actually, people here are very welcome and they expect people to come and to bring and to transfer knowledge. It is, it is essential that, uh, again, because we talk about a, a, a third year uh, uh, um, marriage, uh, we, it's, it, it's, very, it's very important that we, we always have in mind a long-term perspective. And so if we do not create the conditions for the people uh, where the public service is happening to deliver, to manage uh, the asset during the development phase and then during the operation and maintenance phase, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't work. And so um, it is important that when you start, you bring skilled people, but it is very important that you have, um, uh, that you train people almost from day one, because um, it is a question of mindset. It is a question of, of uh, 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 a lot of times, it's also a question of uh, making the private uh, uh, sector understand they are, or they are involved on providing a public service, mm -hmm. and therefore, they have to have a mindset of defending the public interest, which is sometimes not very obvious for the, for the private sector. But again, it has to be trained. And so, the, 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 I, I think, it's, I think there, there, are, there are two waves of changes. The first one is to have private sector people understanding that public sector actually is very noble, and having public sector people understanding that private sector can bring some dynamics and new ideas and some innovation. Mm -hmm. But then, this, I would say, is between public and private. Then, I would say, in particular, in Africa, it's very encouraging because you really have to bring in the transfer of knowledge, the capacity building into the program. It's impossible to have PPPs. 
PPP at the end is all about people, you know, and the process itself, it's about people to also. So it's about people knowing what to do, how to live together for a long term. And that's, that's, that's very encouraging. Very true, all about people. But Louis, I'd like to get your views on this. It sounds it's fairly simple to do a skills transference on a high level uh, platform, but what about the blue collar workers? In a country like South Africa, we've got a 25% unemployment rate across the continent as well. People are living in dire situations, poverty stricken. How do we see some of those elements trickle down to the man on the street? I think it's a, one of the biggest challenges of the PPP, and uh, James might want to touch on this in terms of how it's mandated uh, within the South African environment to make sure that the skills transfer is done successfully. But at the same time, it's not just about the project. It's making sure that the skill set you're providing, especially down at the blue collar worker level, is something that can serve that person going forward, whether he continues to work in that specific industry or whether he can transfer it. It doesn't help you make it so specialized or that you make it uh, so economically constrained. Uh, that it isn't a sustainable skill set that's transferred. Mm -hmm. James, your sentiments? Yes, I just wanted to add to, to, to what uh, Louis just said, is that in our request for proposals uh, on any PPP, there's a, a specific requirement, uh, not only for black economic empowerment, but also for skills transfer and for capacity building, uh, and also for socioeconomic development. Uh, for instance, in terms, you mentioned the, the high level of unemployment we will typically require what are, what are called labor-intensive uh, construction methods, mm. uh, which means you have to employ a lot of people to actually lay the brick wall rather than uh, put up forms and pour cement, uh, things like that. So we're, we're taking, uh, we think, uh, uh, many steps to try to effect the kind of uh, skills transfer that Louis was referring to, one that is sustainable once that training or that skills transfer has, has been completed. Now that works for South Africa, but Mohamed Do on the rest of the continent, do we have similar initiatives like this for young ladies and gentlemen growing up in Ghana, Nigeria, as well as Kenya? In countries like uh, Nigeria, as you may know, in Ghana, they have a local content, which is part of the petroleum bill in the, in the, in the uh, case of Nigeria. And uh, what that local content uh, says is that you have to employ a certain number of people and to be able to employ those no certain number of people, you have to train them. And uh, yeah, so we, I believe there is no two ways uh, about it, especially when you consider that, uh, as Pedro was saying, when you look at, you know, again, the funding gap, a lot of it, we estimate 25% of that is maintenance work. You cannot really have the construction EPC contractor do the maintenance work for 10 years after you have um, completed the project. So you need the uh, the uh, people locally to do uh, that that are trained properly to do the uh, the um, the maintenance. Um, now, one thing that is a little bit uh, uh, controversial is the type of skills that that you also need. We think and um, that there there may be need to have more uh, color workers, more engineers, and less, let's say, softy skills like us, uh, financiers, <laughs> lawyers, and the rest. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's engineers who build things. I mean, you can, have all, you can have all the financial engineering that you need. You know, if you don't have, a, if you don't have somebody that can actually build that bridge, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, going to, it's not going to happen. Before we go, we want to get everyone's uh, one sentence your thoughts on the future of PPP, the marriage on the African continent. Mohamed Do, let's start with you. In one sentence, I would say, I think it's about skills and, and, and uh, trust. Pedro? I would, I would, uh, I would, I would say um, uh, choose carefully a first project, uh, transform it into a showcase, and grow from there. Louis? I think it's about honesty. You've got to be brutally honest when you do a PPP, whether you're government or whether you're private sector. Uh, why are you doing it and are you actually adding value to the transaction by holding the position you do? James? A PPP is just a procurement method. It's just a way of buying something. If you learn how to procure via a PPP, you can procure anything else you want and it will be a success because it's disciplined because it requires a feasibility study and, and because you, you can understand the outcome uh, 
uh, going in and more importantly, it's bankable. Of course, Rome wasn't built in a day and Africa certainly won't be either. But some fundamental points were made at this year's Africa Public-Private Partnership Conference. We had the African Development Bank's Mohamedou Niang saying that the continent cannot do without PPPs when you look at the scale of Africa's needs. James Aiello from South Africa's National Treasury highlighted the importance of transferring skills. Pedro Neves of Andrade Gutierrez reiterated that it's vital that we define our priorities in order to create projects that are actually bankable. The Development Bank of Southern Africa's Louis Stradum maintained that the banking sector should not wait for PPP projects to happen, but rather assist in the facilitation and even the conceptualization. Key thoughts to consider as the continent strives towards prosperity. Thank you for joining us. From me, Gugule Tumfupi, and the team, it's goodbye for now. Thank you.